Institute Faculty Awards, the Anne Ferrin Curriculum Design Award, and the Milton and Sonia Greenberg Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Award. Also, a big welcome to participants and award recipients who might be with us via Zoom. So I'm waving to the Zoom camera there, I think. Welcome. Um, we are also very fortunate to have Anne Ferrin with us here today. Um, not all of you might know that it's more than a conference. Welcome, Anne. So Anne directed AU's general education program and served the university in many other capacities, including acting provost, uh, and has a longstanding interest in higher education in general and general education and learning outcomes, et cetera, in particular. And we're very grateful to Anne for making this curriculum design award uh, possible. All right, so the Anne Ferran Curriculum Design Award. Now I can't advance the slides here. So technology is playing a joke on me. Give me a second. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second and see if that helps. It actually makes me happy when technology fails us, especially in the age of AI. So hold it, hold on a second. I, uh, I'm gonna try to go into different, it's actually completely stuck here. Let me try this instead. Okay. I'm gonna actually ask our co-facilitators to sh share the slide in Zoom separately so we can have it up here. Here we go. So, um, sorry about that. The Anne Ferrin Curriculum Design Award recognizes the collaborative work of two or more faculty who creatively integrate the values of a liberal education in the design of courses or curricula for majors or academic programs. Um, and um, the 2023-2024 winners is a team of 14 linguistics faculty from the Department of World Languages and Cultures, led by Emilia Tseng. Here we go, here they all are. I'm gonna read all of their names. So this includes Naomi Barron, Robin Barr, Hassan Bohar, Bokhari, Luis Cerezo Ceballos, Elena Chernish, Chip Gerfen, Daniel Ginsberg, Alina Israeli, Tabitha Kidwell, Ken Knight, Sarah Knowles, Rita Morandi, and Polina Vinogradova. All right, so, um, Emilia and her team is recognized with this award for launching the new linguistics minor in fall of 2023, developed through both faculty and student input. The linguistics minor is designed to resonate with AU students' interest in critical scholarship and social engagement in world languages and cultures and across disciplines and departments. In addition, the linguistics department launched the linguistics newsletter and Instagram um, monthly program social events and a student linguistics club, I believe launched in fall of 2024 or will, it will, it's in the future still. It launched last year, so it was in the fall of 2023. I live in the past. All right, or in the future. So <laughs> with that, I would like to welcome Amelia Tseng and Rita Morandi, one of her uh, collaborators up to the, to the stage, it's not a stage, to the front. Um, both of them are representing the winning team here today, uh, so please come forward and please all of you join me in congratulating the entire team for their accomplishments and on winning this award. Thank you all so much. So Amelia and Rita will now give a short presentation on their project. And we'll see if PowerPoint lets us switch to a different presentation. Okay, I'm gonna to try to share this now with the Zoom as well. Um, you, you, it should launch automatically actually, I think. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing sharing it right now and this should work. <laughs> oh, it's the wrong one. Uh, spoiler alert. All right. Thank you, Sonia. Here it is. Okay. Yeah. Sneak preview is a better one. All right. Let me just hide this menu. There you go. Wonderful. The door is yours. Oh, hello, everyone. Um, hello. <laughs> Welcome back. Happy summer. Happy start of the semester. Um, thank you for being here. We are so deeply, deeply honored um, for our, 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 for our team efforts to be recognized by this, by this award. We are so deeply honored that Ann Farron is here um, to meet in person, um, and, 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 um, and, and we appreciate um, 
the award very, very much. Also, thank you very much to CTRL for everything that you do and all of your support. Um, and of course, thank you to my 13 colleagues, not all of whom could be here today, but Rita came, woo! Um, and Tabitha, I believe, is joining us virtually. So hi, Tabitha. Um, thank you for being here and we have your certificate for you. Um, so we don't have a ton of time to talk. So I just thought I would share some information about our new linguistics program um, for which we received the, the curriculum award. So as you can see, there is indeed a new linguistics program here at AU. Woohoo! <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, very exciting. We're all very enthusiastic about it, as you can tell. Um, so let me tell you a little more. Okay, there we go. So, you know, why? First of all, why? What is the reason for this? Why AU linguistics? Well, linguistics is a growing field of interest for undergraduates across the country, um, per the Linguistic Society of America Bulletin. And from senior colleagues here at AU, um, such as Naomi Barron, Professor Emeritus, we know that students have actually been asking for linguistics for a really long time, for over 20 years at this point. But up until the, now, we didn't have a sort of formal program in order to channel that interest and give them some structure. So they would do capstone projects, they would do ind independent projects, but they didn't have sort of a home. Um, so we wanted to give them that home. And there are a number of other reasons for this as well. Um, I'm about to explain a little bit more about what linguistics is, um, particularly our focus in the program uh, for the, you know, in case you're not all linguists out there. <gasps> <laughs> um, um, but it's uh, our program is very much in line with AU's goals for inclusive excellence. And so we thought, well, this program will be a draw for AU as well as for our department um, and our complementary programs in addition to the program itself. Um, and this is based on student feedback, which was a major part of this program planning and design. Um, um, for example, you know, I almost didn't come because you don't have a linguistics program. I really wanted to study this. I'm thinking about transferring to another school because they have a linguistics program. So we thought, well, we better get on that. Um, this program is also designed to be flexible and to interface with other majors and minors in the Department of World Languages and Cultures, but also in AU more broadly. We wanted something that would serve students' needs and that would not compete with other programs, but would actually complement them. Um, because one of the points about linguistics that's really important is it's not just the study of language, but it's thinking about how language is part of the world. So AU students are really interested, we all are, in these issues of sort of how does the world work, how can we make it a better place? And if we're going to understand things like policy, like politics, like international relations, um, like education, we have to understand how people speak. Um, and how they think about language, because that's a really big part of identity and often sadly prejudice that can fly under the radar because it's a little less obvious than some of the other ways um, that people might experience discrimination. Our program is also unique among linguistics minors in the DC area in that we have this international focus and we have a specific focus on research training. Again, AU students are very um, inquisitive. They're very um, they're very interested in finding things out on their own, and undergraduate research is one of the areas that we've been working on as an institution. Um, we in the program felt that it's really important for students to get a solid foundation in the basics, because it's a minor, although we hope to grow it, um, but also to get solid training in how you answer questions in the field and to get their, um, their, their hands dirty or their feet wet, whichever metaphor you prefer, <laughs> for how do you actually go about answering some of these questions. Okay, so what exactly is linguistics anyway? given that little spiel. You know, what am I even talking about? <laughs> well, um, linguistics is very broadly speaking, the scientific study of language, right? So what does that mean? I mean, that's huge, right? <laughs> There's different types of linguistics. Some people might look at more uh, um, at, at what we learned in school as grammar, like word structure. Some might, people might look at order. Some people look at politeness. Some people look at sound. Um, AU Linguistics Program Focus has a little bit of all of that to cover the essentials, but really the broad picture is thinking about sociocultural approaches to language. So language in the world and language making the world, right? It sounds kind of abstract, but there's a reciprocal relationship between language and society in that without language, you know, we can't do anything. <laughs> I like to think of language as sort of like air. It's all around us and we can't do anything without it. But because it's invisible and it's everywhere, we sort of take it for granted. It fades into the background. And yet if you turn on the TV and listen to any politician's speech, you can see that language is absolutely key to how they're getting their message across, how they're using their language, how they're portraying different groups of people, um, how they're laying out goals for society. And these kinds of things happen on the daily as well. So that's what we want people, what we want our students to get out of this. Besides an introduction to this in demand field, is an understanding of this particular aspect of critical social awareness and a new ability to problem solve and to think about how this can tie into the other things they may be studying, right? 
so that when they go out and they do other areas of social sciences, of humanities, of, of, of whatever areas they may be interested in, they're not missing out on this sort of important leg of, this, of, of, of the stool, this important part of the, of the puzzle. Um, and while they're doing this, they get many, many transferable skills as well in the social sciences, humanities, and communication. Okay, what is linguistics not? I could go on, but you know, I won't. <laughs> okay, what is it not? And I'm happy in the Q&A to answer any um, other questions people might have. Any question, I'm sure Rita will be too, right? Not to throw you out there, Rita. Um, what is linguistics not? Okay, it's not just being multilingual, although that is part of what makes our program unique. Many linguists are multilingual or work on different languages around the world, but you sometimes hear people say, oh, you know, you're a linguist, you must speak, you must speak so many languages. Well, some of us do and some people don't, it's not a requirement, right? That is, however, part of what makes our AU program unique because we're part of world languages and cultures. And so we designed this program to really intersect with our um, existing programs. It is not just for language majors. You do not have to be a language major to take to um, minor in linguistics. It is not the same as a translation certificate, although that is something you can integrate with the program. It is not the same as teaching English as a second language, although that's another wonderful program we have in our department. And yes, it can be done entirely in English. <laughs> These are sort of some common questions that come up. However, we encourage students to um, pursue their other language interests as part of this, You know, Russian, French, Italian, German, Spanish, Korean, Japanese, Arabic, et cetera. And ultimately, we want students to be able to understand the world critically through this lens of language and be able to apply it in their other areas of interest to make a positive difference in the world. As you might imagine, too, DC is a wonderful city for this. I mean, so international, so much diversity. Um, there's so much going on. It's a wonderful sort of lab to look at language and society and also for students to apply what they learn. OK, so this is just um, right from the website. I'm going to attempt to open up the website here and just show you a little bit. So bear with me if it. Hey, look at that. Okay, um, this is our website. And all of this is new since last year, by the way. So, you know, huge shout out to the team and to everybody who helped make this happen. Um, so, you know, you can see just sort of what we do. Oop. Um, here's the crowd from the Mueller Linguistics Lecture last year, coming up this year on October 24th, if anyone's um, interested. I'm gonna admit, Tabitha, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can see we had a big and enthusiastic crowd. I'll share a little bit more about that in a sec. Um, you know, here's a little more information about this. Here's our Q and A. Um, what I really wanted to show you is our faculty, because as you might imagine, there's a lot of us. <laughs> so um, here you can see the, the the core faculty who were named in this grant, and also um, other faculty um, who who joined afterwards. You can just see, you know. There's a lot of us, we're friendly. We all have different specialties, different languages, different areas. Um, and in, in my own opinion, everybody's wonderful. I mean, I'm biased, but I think everyone's wonderful. It's great to work together. So here we all are. Um, we all wear numerous hats. Um, let's see if we can find Rita specifically. Hey, <laughs> there's Rita, look, there's Rita, hey. And here's Tabitha who just joined us. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to show you while we're here is our linguistics lecture series. So this is something we're very excited about, which was actually started by the first department chair in world languages and cultures way back in the 70s or 80s. Um, and we brought this back when we brought back the program. So we did this last year. Oh, yep, he founded the department in 1959 and established this in the 70s. So last year, our first speaker was Dr. Nelson Flores from the University of Pennsylvania, who was talking about language and race and identity. Um, so this was really um, fascinating. And, um, you know, you can watch the video here if you're interested. We were co-sponsored by a number of departments, anthropology, sociology, education, Latinx studies, Center for Latin American Latino Studies, um, Center for Diversity and Equity. So um, we're excited about that. And we have another of those coming up on October 24th, but with a different theme. This year, the theme is language and gender. So abstract to follow. Um, as you as you probably know, this idea of sort of language and gender, and is it just grammar or is it purely social or is it both and why do people care so much um, is a big deal in the States, right? Pronouns, it's a big deal in other languages, Latinx, it's a big deal around the world. You know, the, pre the president of France kind of made a big statement about how absolutely not. Um, and so, you know, in a sense, this really goes to the idea that language is social, because if it is just grammar, like, why would anybody care, right? If it is purely grammatical, like you often hear, and so it shouldn't be changed, then, like, why is everybody so upset about it? Um, so things like that are what we're going to be talking about this fall. Um, how do I advance? There we go. Okay. Yep, there it is again. So new coming up, new talk coming up on, I don't know how to make this bar go away. Um, 
Ah, thank you. See, all this teaching online, and I did not know that. <laughs> so coming up at the end of October. Um, okay, cool. Um, also, I wanted to show you quickly our Instagram, because this is fun. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Um, this is mostly student-centered, so you can hear, see here some of the things that we've been doing um, to get the word out in student events. So you can see you know, we have a newsletter, we do spotlights of faculty, you can see here um, a picture of students from our last social, um, all our donuts. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's a good time. There's, there's enthusiasm there, um, and we're having a good time with that. Um, Here's a bigger picture of the final social of the year. So, you know, it's 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 been good. So we're we're happy about the enthusiastic response we're getting from students um, because it shows that this that we're on the right track with this program and with their interests and um, with contributions to our department. Um, and as part of this, I'm about to talk about this and then I'll be done. Um, you know, we, we pulled quite heavily from existing classes. So there are classes around campus, for example, in anthropology um, that, are, that are linguistically focused. Um, there are also many classes that already existed in our own department in different languages um, that were relevant. So we pulled those together to make a flexible minor and we also um, designed some new classes. Um, so this is just, Kind of boring, but you can see the program of study. Um, we pulled in the existing class, TESOL 400 Principles of Linguistics, and I'm very happy to share um, that we do seem to be seeing something positive from both the TESOL program and the linguistics side of things because um, the enrollments are really high. Um, in fact, we just the um, TESOL program just opened up a new section of this, which is great news for linguistics because it's a prereq for our classes or also concurrent. Um, this is the other class we're offering in the fall right now. Um, and then you can see that there's a number of other courses here, including two, Ling 402 and 3, designed by our very own Rita. <laughs> so thank you, Rita, um, who worked um, really, really hard and collaboratively in order to design those. Um, we also have our linguistics research methods class that I mentioned, and then um, a whole slew of electives that people can take. So we won't kind of belabor that, but the point is that it's a flexible program. There's a bunch of different ways that students can do this minor if they choose to, while, while still taking the other classes that they need to do for their other interests and their other programs. Okay, yeah, we'll just sort of whip through this. Yep, all right, okay. Um, so if you're interested, we're always happy to talk. Um, we're in Gray Hall on the second floor. Also, you know, if, if you're so inclined, here's the web links and the QR codes for those of you who do that. Um, and thank you very much um, for the recognition and for your time. One, two, three. We, we have some time for questions, about five minutes or so. And so if you're in the Zoom, you can type your questions into the chat and one of our session facilitators will relay those via phone, I think. I'll grab my phone. And if you're in the room, you can just raise your hand. Should I close out of these slides or just leave them? Oh, that's your phone. Um, sorry. Yes, this is your phone, sorry. I was using it for timing. Um, you can close out. Okay. Yeah. And uh, if you want to grab this. Okay. okay. Any questions? Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Sorry, um, I'm Gihan Fernando from the Career Center. I was curious, um, given how you were talking about linguistics and language and it's important in the world and how we speak and it being in the air around us and so on, are there any collaborations with the School of Communication we have some, work? We do have some and we're hope we would love to build out more in future. We have some courses that are cross-listed with them. Um, and WLC also has, has ties with the school for some time now. So that's something that we're very interested in pursuing. Um, also with the School of Education, um, with, with other, some of the other departments that I mentioned. We see a lot of room there and, and we, we love working collaboratively, obviously. So <laughs> that's one of our goals, yeah. Hi. A comment and a quick plug. I'm Hannah Dardine. I'm with CTRL, one of the teaching and learning sessions. Oh we haven't met him so much for everything that you have been doing. Um, but one of, I just wanted to highlight that one of our student partners last semester, I'm excited that when you announced what the topic of the upcoming talk was this fall, because one of our student partners wrote something about gender and language cool. and gender use of language in the classroom and how mm. that can set up um, a space where certain students might feel marginalized because of the way language is interpreted or used by the instructor or um, specifically like feminine speech patterns and how it's often associated with not being prepared or not being confident or mm -hmm. with your ideas. So um, 
I'm excited for that talk and cool. um, to hear more from your perspective too. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, like right now or just in general? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it's important. It really is important. And I'll just, you know, to that point, I'd say it's something that's, you know, very much on our students' minds, these social issues, but they're very much social hot button topics too. I mean, I mentioned like gender neutral language and how that's sort of a, a big flap and has been for some time. And it tends to get framed as like just this US woke thing, but actually it's all over the world. Um, but to your point specifically, Hannah, I mean, this this question of how women speak versus how men speak and is it something innate or is it something learned and you know is is, is it in, is it inferior and kind of weak sounding or is it okay but you need to learn how to not do it that way if you're going to be a business person they're very much alive as as social debates right um, and you see a lot of op ed pieces and things like the Atlantic and stuff talking precisely about that you know how do young women speak and is it okay and do we need to you know do we need to do something about it um, and besides the very practical stakes at, at um, um, issues at stake, of course, what it is ultimately is this question of who's being policed, right? What kind of sort of policing and monitoring are we doing of, of whose language and why? So a um, little bit of, I mean, since you asked, <laughs> since you asked. Yeah. So we are at time. We're going to switch over to our second award presentation. Thank you so much again, Amelia and, and Rita and all of the rest of the community uh, who created this program. And now PowerPoint is striking again. Again. I'm gonna see if this works. Nope. All right. All right. Um Okay, so the Milton and Sonia Greenberg Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Award recognizes faculty who have made a significant contribution to the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, or SOTL. Uh, that is research in which they systematically assess and share their teaching practices. This award is made possible by the late Milton and Sonia Greenberg, uh, and the 2023-2024 winner is Sonia Greer from the Department of Marketing in COGAD. Sonia is recognized with this award for developing and assessing race in the marketplace, a business marketing course that integrates race, an often overlooked aspect of identity in market, marketing curricula. Using a mixed methods approach to assess the impact of the course, her research found that the course increased students' awareness of racial dynamics, improved critical thinking, and enhanced their ability to analyze and address racial issues in marketing. Her work demonstrates the value of examining racial dynamics in marketing education. And with that, I would like to welcome Sonia Greer to the front. Please join me in congratulating her for, the, for her accomplishments and for winning this award. All right. Um, and with that, uh, Sonia, go ahead. We, we can switch to your presentation here. It lets us, it should, yes. All right. Now we have the correct one. And let me just quickly share it to our online participants as well. So it will do it, I believe. Is it worth to do this now? There we go. All right. Uh oh. It's not moving. So now we cheer because technology is failing us again. <laughs> uh, try stop sharing. Let's just do it like this. We're going to have to share the slides afterwards, I think. Here you go. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here today and taking time out of your day. This is indeed an honor for me to receive this award in particular about the scholarship of teaching and learning because I'm really a newbie to this area. So today I'm gonna to talk about my motivation for the research that I started, um, the conceptual background and the findings that I have to date. 
Um, there's a lot more that I could say, but I'm going to go quickly through some of these things to make sure that I stick to 15 minutes. So my motivation, my motivation for this is that I sort of stumbled into some research on the scholarship of teaching and learning. I created an experiential diversity um, assignment for my marketing for social change class some years ago. Um, this was in conjunction with, it's a community-based course, Marcy Campos is in the back, and so we worked heavily with that office over the years. This course has always been a community-based course. And they developed some diversity plans, marketing plans for different organizations. And we did some research on the effectiveness of how that increased their awareness and understanding of diversity issues. I've also been really um, intentional in wanting to integrate race into the business curriculum. My research is around race. We see the need um, for this issue. And I had several slides about motivation, but I think that's kind of apparent here. And one of the things that comes up a lot is linguistics and language in that course as well. So this connects us to uh, the new program as well. So I was creating this course and I wanted to use it to prepare students to support marketplace equity. So thinking ahead of how I could measure and get some sense of exactly what they were learning and what they were doing. So the Race in the Marketplace course uh, was developed in 2022 as a div course. And so the, this has been the context for my research. The course prepares students to identify, navigate, and address racial dynamics in the marketplace. There was no such existing course. There are courses that focus on multicultural marketing. They focus on culture. There are courses that focus on diversity. They focus on everything. Um, and not specifically on race. And so I wanted this course to focus specifically on issues of racial dynamics in the marketplace because this is what we see very often. I used a backwards course design approach and that approach says you start with these learning objectives and then you develop assessments and instructional strategies. And so the learning objectives I developed were based upon this emerging um, area of research called race in the marketplace. And you can see the text, the first textbook there, of which I'm a co-editor. Um, and so these are the learning objectives that I created for that. And so the issue then became, based on these learning objectives, how can the course create critical engagement with these learning objectives? And I'm going to tell you why critical engagement is important. Engagement is talked about a lot in the literature in terms of leading to better memory, deeper understanding, and enhanced learning. But critical engagement, which takes this basic engagement, is a lot deeper emphasis on taking the knowledge, debating it, counter-arguing with it, and going a lot deeper in ways that might allow students to use that, um, that information. Critical engagement also is going to enhance the probability that they would use the knowledge after they leave the class. And that's the whole purpose if we want to engender a social justice orientation in our students. So critical engagement, I, I'll try not to go too fast, also um, means that you really have to understand the context in which these incidents and um, dynamics in the marketplace exist. So understanding broader historical, social, and cultural context as well as you probably saw in the learning objectives. It also means that students have to really actively question the knowledge. So as I design the assessments and instructional strategies, I'm gonna talk about three different strategies that I use to create critical engagement through the design. First one, to engage students, learning has to be relevant. We knew this, we know this, and we know research tells us it needs to be relevant to their goals, their identity, or their interest. So assignments must allow an active role for students to kind of see themselves and put themselves into the knowledge construction. So I had two different assignments that I developed, the reflection journal and the blog and tell assignments, which connect to their interpretation of what are relevant challenges in the marketplace. They also allow students to have choice and freedom within their own assignments. So the blog and tell, where the students are required to identify a relevant example, post a summary of this example before class, present it to their classmates in five minutes, where they describe how it reflects something about race in the market, and then provide a provocative question for class discussion. 
The reflection journal is a structured way to reflect on the course content. They submit four journals throughout the semester and that's all. They just are told, reflect on whatever you'd like in one page or less. And so you could see that both of these are very loosely structured, open-ended assignments that allow them to insert themselves in their selection, identification of what marketing challenges are. The second strategy I used was one of a, an instructional strategy focused on essential questions. So essential questions are necessary when few materials really emphasize the disciplinary and the substantive dimensions of what you're developing. As I mentioned, a lot of the articles and cases just don't really address racial dynamics in the marketplace. So these three questions were used to help students really frame their racialized marketplace experiences that we were talking about in the context of marketing concepts. They were used in assignments, in discussions, and in case analyses all throughout the class. I introduced them the first week so students know. We want to know what is the role of marketing in the focal issue that we're talking about. What is the role of race and what are important intersectional elements and how could the situation be different? And when we open up that sort of creativity of thinking how it could be different, we can then drill down to think about how marketing could be used to help get to that different reality. When I look to assess critical engagement, the method that we used was analysis of the reflection journals and the blog and tell assignment. And the literature talks about how analysis of student work is really underutilized in terms of our understanding of how students learn. So I reviewed the blog and tell submissions that were posted on the discussion page, my class notes, as well as the feedback I gave them and the grade they got. I also conducted a thematic analysis of reflection journals, and we looked for the traditional engagement criteria, which build off of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral engagement with a focus on the critical nature of those aspects. I also conducted in the most recent class where I had enough students, a pre and post survey that was linked to the essential questions. So for blog and tell, the student submissions spanned a wide range of topics, everything from health disparities to caste in Latin America um, to uh, land rights in Brazil. And they were frequently linked to their identity, interest, or prior experiences. The submissions also reflected extensive preparation, and they were often framed by the essential questions, although that was not part of the assignment at all. And in fact, I often had to stop students from talking. Um, I wanted to make one of those things to kind of pull them off the stage, <laughs> um, but we made it a lot of fun, but I had to, you know, we stop, stop. Students would go well over 10 minutes. One student went 15 minutes once, and I, we gotta stop. This is supposed to be a five minute assignment. The prompt is like three sentences and they were all in. Students would also counter argue the various elements of an issue. So if a student presented one thing, other students, and they were very respectful, would say, well, what about this? What about this? Let's think about these other aspects of this. So it was clear that they were engaging very critically. I don't expect you to be able to read all of this, but get, this gives you an example of how the blog and tell, which was this, you know, just post something and talk about it in five minutes, they would include uh, charts and tables and citations and would go into all these different areas. Um, one, the first one um, about the first Asian American bachelorette, the student who had not really spoken um, in the first five weeks of class, a young Asian American woman, she came up and she said, can you believe it has taken 22 seasons for there to be an Asian American bachelorette? And she was very, you know, emotionally engaged and you could see that she had thought about it. And she went on to discuss how that related to identity and the importance of seeing yourself in marketing. In terms of the journal analysis, we have identified two focal themes. One is new perspective and the other is working for equity. One focuses on the internal changes that they have um, felt over the semester. The other focuses on the external changes as they have felt. Many were surprised. I have a whole new perspective. I had no idea this was going on. I had no idea there were neighborhoods without grocery stores. I had no idea that race played a role in Airbnb hosting, all of these different types of issues. Both themes really reflect critical engagement with course content 
and expressed intentions to use their course learnings towards social justice in their career and in their life. Here's an example of two journal posts. One, I love this course and I feel myself speaking more confidently about race in the addressable market more outside of the room. Two, to me, this is not just a class. It's a tool for our generation to change the world. This is a tool for dismantling the harmful structures on a corporate level that have oppressed people like me since European settlement in the Americas. To me, this is not just a grade. It's a way for me to sharpen my tools to fight. And there were lots of comments like that, which is you know pretty amazing when you think about it. And again, this was a prompt. Just tell me what you're thinking about the class. Consider this your conversation with me um, in terms of the journal. I also conducted this survey in order to get from the students and hear from the students what they thought they had learned. And we see these significant changes among those same areas that link to the essential questions. These questions I got from Tracy Dennis, um, who used to be here at AU. Um, and they look at knowing how to analyze based on race, knowing how to analyze through an intersectional lens, knowing how to apply marketing and thinking about the marketplace and how race and racism operate in the marketplace. So my key learnings from this so far is that students critically engaged with the course content, these design strategies, embedded opportunities to participate in the knowledge creation were very influential. We often say, I hear it all the time, let's meet students where they are. This provides a way to meet students where they are because the information that I get from each journal and the information from each blog and tell we continue to use it throughout the semester. So st and students remember it because they kind of run blog and tell. I go sit down and I take notes and you know the person takes over with the presentation and they select who you know answers their questions and everything. And so this is a way for them to be active participants in the course. Um, I think the findings also highlight other important metrics that we don't think about as much like confidence and experiential knowledge. Um, this last semester, I had an alumni group um, come to class. This was one of the alums who wrote me and said, I think you need to have an alumni group in your class. Okay. And she set it up. She found several people. I gave her names of people who had been in the class. We had um, five different people who talked about how they were using what they learned in their jobs now. And confidence was a very common um, thread through their discussion. So that seems to be something in certain areas, particularly around race, that we might think about different types of metrics. I have two collaborators. I'm working on a paper right now. One is B. Porter, who was an anthropology master student here at AU, and she was my teaching assistant when I developed the course. And we've still been working since 2022 on this. And the other is Dr. Francesca Sobande, who's at Cardiff University, and she was a guest speaker and a judge for the final projects throughout the semester. And she's also been heavily involved in the class. So I'd love to hear any questions and comments. And again, thank you for listening. And I hope I kept to time. <laughs> All right, a quick reminder to our Zoom attendees that you can post your questions in the chat and we will relay them to Sonia here in the room. All right, Maria. Thank you, Maria de Jesus SIS. Sonia, thank you so much. This is such a wonderful initiative. I'm thinking through for my own course this fall, two of them, where I'm also using a reflective journal, um, experiential uh, assignment. I wanted uh, to hear more a little bit about how, so are they also reflecting on the readings and need to integrate some of those concepts or is it just they choose specific examples that they're thinking of that are salient for them and they respond in that way in conjunction to the readings? Can you tell us a little more about how you, you yeah, did that? The prop basically said, you are required to, to submit four times throughout the semester for two points each. And I say, this is really a gift. I just want to hear your evolving thoughts, ideas, and beliefs about the course and the course content. Period. Um, one page maximum. Many of them go well over one page. <laughs> and I think another um, piece that I didn't get to say is the whole notion of the um, heterogeneity of the students. Because students come from different places in terms of their knowledge, the whole notion of meeting them where they are, 
the journal lets them talk about what's important to them, just as the blog and tell lets them sort of think about it in relation to them. And that helps lets everyone be involved. It's a way of creating inclusion and class that we may not necessarily think about across people with diverse experiences. A lot of the literature that I was reading about race in the classroom is like, ooh, if I'm really scared to talk about it, it's going to really be challenging. It'll be really hard because some students may have had experiences and other students have not. And so how do you sort of address that gap in people's experiences? And this allows to do so because they were bringing up examples I might not have ever thought of, but now the whole class can work through it. Marcy? Reflections, right? No, no, they do not. They see each other's blog and tell. Oh, but, but not only the I see the reflection journal. And are they on Canvas or where are they? They submit them on Canvas to okay. me. Okay, so they're private. Interesting. Yeah, they're private. We do have some more time for questions. Anyone else? Zoom audience, any questions from you? <laughs> Hannah. Hi, Sonia. Thank you so much. I, I was taking notes. I love the blog and tell as an idea. And the reflection journal is something I do a lot of in my teaching. I teach in the School of Education. Um, we get a lot of questions about AI, of course, right? And I think these are two great examples of not AI proof assignments, but essentially AI proof assignments and that they're very personal. They're very motivating. Um, they're not just something that they could type into ChatGPT and ask for the answer for. Um, so I think they're just, I wanted to share that with everybody, great examples of the ways we can start moving towards things that really engage the students in a way that is going to combat some of this fear around, are the students using AI to complete their assignments, right? Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Another uh, point I will make about that, the blog and tell, actually I've been, um, I've used for a while and it's evolved into where it is now, but it actually used to be called show and tell. Remember show and tell from elementary school um, until the computer became um, a lot more irrelevant. I had to change it to blog and tell. Any final questions from the audience in the room or on Zoom? We're a little early, but we have other sessions this afternoon. So first of all, thank you, Sonia, for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and also, again, a big congratulations to all of the winners of both of these awards. Uh, thank you and congratulations. And then before you leave, for those of you in the room and on Zoom, if you could take a moment to fill out the feedback form for this session, as you have in the other sessions, you can use the QR code up on the screen. If you're on Zoom, there is a link in the chat. You might have gotten a form when you entered the room. We do have the, the paper forms as well, if you prefer it. So once again, thank you so much. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of the, the uh, sessions this afternoon and that you had a good three-day series of the August Faculty Workshops. Thank you.